I was interested in doing a martial art and uh, my first teacher Terry Ezra came to my high school and he did a demonstration and from the moment I saw it I just thought yeah this is great this is what I want to do I thought it was wonderful even though I was very young um, the movements and the philosophy and uh, how it was presented to me seemed very natural and very logical so as a kid it really appealed to me. And my first teacher uh, was a, a guy called Steve Parr and I really should mention him because he ran my local dojo in Chester. Uh, he was fourth Q. Can you believe it? He was fourth Q. But in those days a lot of people were fourth Q. If you were third Q you were a senior grade, you know. There were no Sandans around. It was actually just post Chiba Sensei. So Chiba Sensei had left about a year, year or two before. This was 1980. So it was very much the aftermath of Chiba Sensei being there. Kanetsuka Sensei was the technical director. He had become the technical director of the BAF at that time. Uh, but there was still a strong influence from the time that Chiba Sensei was there. And these two influences started to diverge at that time. So I was more uh, to, to veered towards the Kanetsuka Sensei side. He became the technical director, so he was the technical director that I knew. I did not know Chiba Sensei from the 1980s. Saying that, in 1982 or 83, Chiba Sensei came back to the UK and he taught a summer school in Lancaster, and that was the first time I had seen him. And I went to San Diego after that when I was 16. I went for a couple of weeks to train with him then. So that was my first exposure to Chiba Sensei. So I'd only done Aikido for maybe five years and I, I suddenly went to this dojo. I couldn't understand it at all. I, I, I really, it was a very strange experience for me to be in that environment. You know, I'd come from a small town in England, you know, with my local dojo, and then suddenly going to uh, a dojo that was called the pressure cooker. And Chiba Sensei was very intense and very, um, I mean, he was at the height of his, you know, power. And I was just a visitor and I was, it was like sightseeing, you know. So he was very nice to me. Um, but still saying that I was very wary of him because, you know, you just, this, this sense of power and, and energy around him was scary. And also I could see what he was doing with his uh, students and, uh, and his daughter at that time. She was very young and she was training. Uh, and uh, so, so I was protected really because I was, I was just a visitor, so, yeah. Yes, I was living in England then, uh, and then a couple of years later I moved down to London to train with Kanetsuka Sensei. I stayed there for about a year, and then I moved to Japan. Then I went to Japan when I was 20. Yes, Ken was one of my first teachers, actually. He lived near Chester, he was not far from uh, Chester, and he used to come down. Every Friday evening we used to have a class which ro would rotate the teachers, and Ken was one of those teachers. So he would come down, and of course we were very excited. We, we were kids, you know, and we were very excited that this man had had tea with O Sensei, and it, it, it was very, and he used to tell us stories, and that was great. He was a lovely guy. And actually before I came to Japan, I went to his house, and he gave me lots of advice about living in Japan. I'd wanted to go to Japan since I was about 16, because I'd heard about Hombu Dojo. We didn't know a lot about Hombu Dojo in England then. We weren't told very much about it. But I had uh, this goal that I really wanted to go there and, uh, and train at Hombu Dojo. So we had a young Japanese man came to England, Tanaka-san, and uh, he was from Hombu Dojo. So he said, yes, you should go, definitely. It's a great experience. And we knew in England, we knew Shibata Sensei. Shibata Sensei had been over. We'd also seen Yamaguchi Sensei at that time. I think Yokota Sensei had also been to England. So we'd had some influence and some contact 
with Hongbu Dojo Shihan at that time. So, so I went. Uh, yes, I mean, I went for Aikido and I, I was planning to teach English. That was going to be uh, what I was going to do to, to survive. But it wasn't so easy in the beginning. It took me a while to get a job. But eventually I got a job and uh, so I tried to, to revolve my job around my training. It depends when I was working. If I was working, I would train uh, you know, the morning. If I was working in the afternoon, if I was working in the, after, in, in the morning, I'd train in the afternoon. So uh, I would just fit it in around my work, yeah. But I mean, most, most mornings I would try to go to w uh, Waka Sensei's class, 6.30 class at the dojo, and then maybe an evening or an afternoon class also. Yeah, as much as I could. Not at all. I, I tried to go to everybody. I didn't discriminate at all. The only teachers I couldn't go to was when I was working. That was the only, and I, I feel very sad now that I never went to Arikawa. I think I went to one of Arikawa Sensei because I was working. So sometimes it was just hard to get to them all, but I usually, I, I tried to go as, as much as possible to see as many as possible. I used to train a lot with Kurobayashi Sensei, Kanazawa Sensei, Etsuji Hori Sensei, Sugawara Sensei and Kobayashi Sensei, they were not Uchideshi at that time. They'd already started teaching, so they weren't in Hombu Dojo. They would come to Osawa Sensei's class on a Thursday morning. Yoko Okamoto Sensei was there, and I would uh, try to train with Yoko. That was the period that, uh, that she was raising her family. She had her babies then, so. And there was two foreign uh, Uchideshi at that time in Hombu Dojo. There was Yahe Solomon and Rosso Fernandez from New Zealand. They were living there for a few years. Yes, I found it very, very strange. And I had a very difficult time outside the dojo. There weren't many foreigners around generally in Japan at that time. Um, we were very exotic. Uh, we, the people were very curious. I was scrutinized a lot. You know, I think as a young, as a young foreign woman too, you know. So sometimes it was very hard and it was, it, it, it was kind of tiring. It was very tiring to have that constantly, you know. I'm sure it did, definitely. I mean, for me, that was my experience. I, I can't say about the other women who were there. There were quite a lot of American women who were there. I don't know if they had the same experiences, but I know from my point of view, I had some uh, <clears throat> kind of difficult times, you know, there. And it was also very lonely. I mean, the, the, you know, you had this sort of solitary existence where you were going to the dojo, you were going to work, and, you know, you were tired a lot of the time, and, and you know, you were being looked at, and it was, it was, it's very lonely. It's very lonely, that kind of life, you know. I was there three and a half years, and at the end, I was, I was ready to go. I wanted to leave, and I think for most people then, they didn't consider that it was a place they would live. It was a transient place. You'd stay for two, three years, and then you would go. I never had any plan to do that. I think that sounds really good, and I should have had that plan, but I didn't which was a mistake that I didn't have that plan. Um, so no, it wasn't part of a, of, a, of, a, of a great plan I had, but that just seemed to be at the finite time that I stayed there. You know? How was it a mistake? Because I never thought about the future. I never even thought about being in Japan as being good for my resume or good in the sense that when, I, when or if I become an Aikido teacher, this would look good that I was in Japan. I never even considered that. I just wanted to train. It was all about, it was very day to day. And even going to San Diego, I went to San Diego straight away after Japan. Uh, it was only with the thought that I didn't want my daily Aikido to stop. And I knew if I went back to the UK, it would stop. 
So that's why I went to San Diego, merely just to continue my daily Aikido life. I had, I had a good friend in Japan, Yahe Solomon, and he recommended that I go to Chiba Sensei. I'd already had some uh, contact with Chiba Sensei, so that was what I did. I went back there. I didn't. I didn't take part. Um, I, I felt for me, I didn't want to do it because of, um, I think my Aikido was quite formed at that stage. I was already Sandan. I had been training for quite a long time since I was very young and I felt it wasn't really what I wanted to do. Then I went back to the UK. My father got very sick and he died. So I went back to the UK and, and I stayed there for three years. Uh, then I tried to do some other stuff, not just Aikido. I had a very small group there in the UK. Where, where, where was that? That was in Chester, yes. But that was interesting. It was an interesting experience to suddenly have gone from those very intensive years of training to suddenly not intense and having people that I had to teach. And I was really stuck. I became really stuck in, in translating what I'd been doing into teaching. When you actually stop your daily training and try to open a dojo, the reality is quite depressing. It can be quite disappointing and depressing. You know, from, from, the, from the start, you get students who are just not as enthusiastic as you. I mean, that's the first reality check you get. So if you believe that you're gonna get students come through the door who just think you're great because you did Aikido for three, four hours a day. And I know a lot of teachers find this. They get sick of teaching beginners. They just want to teach, you know, Yudansha, or they, they just want to teach Kokyunagis, or... But of course, m the majority of your teaching is teaching somebody how to fall, how to stand up, you know, how to turn. That's 90% where you, where you put your foot, where you put your hand. That's it. And, and unless you love that, then you're not going to enjoy teaching. And also, you know, you, I think it's good, it's good experience to have your own dojo and to be creating your own students and makes you a different, different Aikidoka, I think. I think the primary thing that I personally got from Chiba Sensei was how to, how to run a dojo, how to relate to people. That was a huge part of his teaching as well. He was good at giving you an idea of what your responsibilities were as, as an Aikidoka. I think I take, depending what I'm doing, I take different aspects of the various teachers that I trained with. Teaching beginners, teaching beginners, very often I look to who I trained with as a beginner and what, how I learned and what spoke to me as a beginner. So therefore, my first Aikido teachers were my biggest influences. Then. If I'm training with people who are a little bit more advanced, then I take something from a teacher I trained with when I was more advanced. You know, if I'm trying to give some, um, uh, maybe a slightly deeper feeling of Aikido, or then, then, then I would relate to another teacher that I used to train with, you know. So it very much depends on what I'm doing, yeah. For me, of course, my situation is slightly different. You know, I'm married to somebody who has a job. I mean, this, this makes everything quite different. <clears throat> but probably if you ask somebody who is supporting a family through doing Aikido, then I think they're, they're, it's a very precarious life. It's not so good to be like that. So I don't even know if it's possible that somebody can actually be pr purely professional in that sense, you know. I think you have to be very flexible, you have to be very open, you have to drop a lot of your expectations, you know, maybe you have to be more inclusive in what you do. Um, it's very hard to take a hard line as, as a teacher.
Well, you could look at it as dropping your standards, but uh, I think you don't necessarily have to drop your technical standards, but maybe you just have to accept that you're going to get people who come to your dojo who are not going to be able to move in the way you want. They're going to be old, they're going to be overweight, they're going to be predominantly older actually because not many young people come to Aikido. So in that way you have to adapt your standards to what's in front of you rather than drop your standards. Yeah. I think possibly it's maybe a combination of a few things. As teachers get older they tend to not attract younger people. I think this is a, a, a factor. And also I think it's uh, people remaining in power when they should be disseminating power really and delegating power to, to others and getting younger people to teach, getting younger people to teach in their dojo. I mean, th we see that in Greece, you know, younger people teaching in the dojo, you bring younger people in, you know? I mean, they don't want to necessarily have a 50-year-old woman like me teaching them, you know? I mean, that's a fact, so, so uh, it yeah, it, I think it's a bit, it's a bit double-edged, but, but I think if people try to hold on to this, this sort of fantasy that they are going to be the sensei or the teacher for, for ever, I think this is quite damaging, this is quite damaging to Aikido, and they fear, they fear letting go of something. There needs to be some flexibility around uh, teaching or some um, getting young people more involved in, in the teaching process, you know, and also empowering them to feel that they have a future in Aikido. I think it, it, it's very stacked against them, you know, they come and it's the same people, same people again and again, you know. I think that's, uh, it's, it's very calcifying, it's very calcifying for Aikido. But of course that's, it's kind of mixed with a, a, a traditional element of Japan, which has a strong hierarchy, but it, it, it doesn't lend itself to much dynamism, I think. I think that is important, and people's, exp white belts who, ha who are impacted, by Aikido, how has Aikido impacted their lives as, as a Q grade, as a white belt? Because they're important. We always concentrate on the Yudansha or the teachers. But without those people, we're not here. That's the fact. And so if we continually ignore them, then, you know, in 20 years, there's not going to be anybody left to teach. I mean, you know, we might not be, well, you'll be around, you're young, but I might not be around. I might be around in 20 years, but if, you, if you're continually sidelining the beginners or white belts or, you know, I think it's a, it, it, it's a grave mistake really and we'll pay the price, we will really pay the price, you know. A lot of classes I think could be more geared towards lower grades, posture, Taisabaki, simple stuff that we tend to lose sight of. You know, we're flinging people around and we're looking great, you know, but you lose sight of what's really fundamental and what makes people think they're learning something. I mean, I, I feel that from in my own dojo, that people have to feel that they're starting from somewhere and they are progressing and getting better and they have a base, they have a strong base. I think that's important. So maybe that's something that could be looked at, that there's a, there's a fundamental class, there's a basics class for people. Because I think if you miss that part of the training and the development, then you never get that back. You just learn techniques and they're just arbitrary techniques that you're learning, but you have no base or foundation. Well. I think that more men do Aikido than women, I mean generally, that's a fact. Um, I'm not exactly sure why either, maybe men, uh, they are a little bit more ambitious than women to teach, they have a stronger will to power than women, I think women don't naturally take an authoritative position, it's not, not in 
their nature. I'm not saying it's not in all women's natures, but in mostly, I make a generalization, you know. Um, but I'm not really sure why. I guess it's just a proportionate thing that there are more men around than women. And there's, I think there's a strong uh, lack of maybe self-confidence with women, that they can't, they, they're not as powerful, they're not as physically strong as men, you know. Of course, you get small men and big women, so, you know, but, but generally, women are, uh, are not as physically powerful. And I think that maybe makes them less confident that they don't feel that they can um, be, be teachers or, or have any authority. You know, saying that in America, when I was in America, there were many senior women who were very good teachers and very confident and very able to teach. So I think it depends on the country. I think there's a big cultural element, yes, yes. In America, the women are maybe, they're more equal and they're more accepting and their expectations of themselves are, are different. They're very different. But in America, definitely, there is much more gender equality, I think. And I think probably Yamada Sensei and, and also Chiba Sensei, when he, was, he, he, when he was alive, he did a lot to promote women. And they were very open to women teaching. There's so many different sides to that. What's going on on the mat with men and women? I just think it's not as simple as women not being encouraged or men being encouraged. Or I think there's just a lot going on. You know, I, I, it's not a simple answer to that. Obviously, there are issues. There are issues that you see. But um, I mean, I personally have not been greatly affected <clears throat> by many. Uh, been, it's quite lucky, but maybe I have been, but haven't known about it. You know, I do think women have to be twice as good as men to be rated the same. They really, they really do. I think you have to be exceptional as a woman. You know, whereas, you know, I've seen a lot of guys who are quite mediocre and they get teaching positions because they're strong. You know, they can throw people. So that, that, that becomes the, the bottom line, you know, but it's the wrong bottom line. I think probably that's, that's the most common uh, uh, complaint I've heard from women is that they're constantly corrected by men, whatever the, the ability of the man is, that they are just constantly corrected. It's an assumption that the woman is not as good as the man. And I think that's, one, it's very strange. What kind of man does that? You know, I think it's, it's, it's very, uh, very strange. Well, I, I will say that in the, the gender issues meeting tonight. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because that, that, that is a complaint I've heard many times from women. I mean, this, this is everywhere for, for women, yeah. this, this kind of thing, this aggression or, you know, undercutting and things like telling women what to do. And I mean, that's just everywhere. But I think that's how it manifests on the mat and it's physical and it's not very pleasant. It's not very pleasant. It can be very upsetting, very, very upsetting. I don't know how that could change though. I really, I really don't know how that issue can be brought forward and be, be opened. I mean, for me as a teacher, as a female teacher, what is red rag to my bull is a man who does not take ukemi for a woman. And the man can be, be much worse technically than the woman, but he will just not take ukemi for her. And I've seen that on a number of occasions. And I, and I have to say, that's one thing that can get me really angry. That's, I can get very angry when I see that, you know. I think that's a sign of a healthy dojo when there's uh, a good percentage of the dojo is women. If it's just all men, I, when, I, when I'm recommending somebody to go to a dojo, I always say, make sure there's a lot of women in the dojo. Because if there's not, there's something not going right in that dojo. And it's usually a sign that something isn't going right. Definitely, definitely.
One thing I always do which I think helps diminish this uh, it definitely in my, in my dojo, and I think in a lot of dojos, is I always focus on ukemi. When I get beginners coming in, men, I always focus on the ukemi rather than the technique. So they have an understanding that they are falling and receiving a movement. Whatever that movement is, how good or bad, their job is to fall. And I think when you emphasize that, it changes the dynamic. It really changes the dynamic. And I get them to fall by themselves. I don't, I don't, I don't make them fall, you know. But it, that, solo, that solo practice of ukemi, I think it helps them understand, you know. You're not, you're not waiting necessarily to be thrown. That is a practice in of itself. N not intentionally, no. Whether people perceive something else, I don't know. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. Um, but it's very difficult. To, it's very difficult to judge w what you transmit when you are teaching. You know, I, I mean, I don't talk about any anything esoteric or anything like that. Uh, sometimes I talk about you know internal expansion, moving from the center. But I don't talk about uh, any spirituality or, you know, any meditative state. Well, you know, as a teacher, you always like to see somebody behaving well and doing not only good Aikido, but doing Aikido in a, a good, responsible way and in a caring way, looking after the uke, making sure that they're doing not only clear technique, but uh, uh, they're showing good character. I mean, I think that's very important. And quite often, you, you don't always see those two together. It's not, it's not always... Somebody can be very, very good at Aikido, but not necessarily display good character. Quite often it manifests physically, if, if mentally they're not there. It will manifest. So it, it, it is quite hard, actually, to, uh, to separate those two. Oh, I'm so depressed. No, I don't think it does. It can, but it doesn't, it doesn't just by doing it. I think if you practice well and with sincerity and really care about your partner then it makes you a better person but just the act of doing Aikido arbitrarily no it doesn't just make you a better person I think that's that's the dream but it doesn't I knew my husband uh, from when I was 16 he used to come over from Dublin with the Irish uh, Aikido group to the BAF summer schools and I knew him from there and I met him again in 1995 in America because I'd gone back to America for a couple of weeks and he was going to stay there for six months so I met him then he invited me to come to Greece to teach a seminar so that's how it happened I came to, uh, then I moved to Greece to be with him uh, he already had a dojo in Greece and uh, a group and then I came over and we, we ran it together did it together. It's gone, I would say, from being a very small activity to suddenly mushrooming in the last six, seven years. So now there are, you know, tens and tens of dojos around. We try as best as we can to collaborate and to, uh, and, and this, this potential IAF uh, recognition, if you call it that. Uh, we are we are all working together to achieve this, which is great. We're all on board with that. Um, there's a lot of different seminars that happen in Greece, so you know we try to support as many seminars as we can. We have uh, Sugawara Sensei or Kobayashi Sensei come over from Hombu Dojo, so this is a um, a joint seminar with all of the Hombu recognised groups within Greece. 
we're all in, inviting uh, those teachers, so yeah. I feel exactly the same. I will always be a student of Hombu Dojo. For me that hasn't changed at all. That's, that, that makes no difference. Like I'd always think, could I take Guru Kemi for Sugawara Sensei? Could I take Guru Kemi for Kobayashi Sensei? You know, that would always be my primary thought.